Hello and welcome. My name is Dan Meyer. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of RCR Wireless News. Joining me today is Michael Thielander, who's founder and CEO of Signals Research Group. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. We, we appreciate it. Sure. Great. Well, one thing we're talking about today uh, is a little bit on small cells. Uh, for those who have ever read any of Mike's work or anything from Signals Research, you know that they uh, provide very in-depth and at times technical knowledge on topics. Uh, and Mike has done a very good job in the past providing great insights into network issues, uh, capacity issues, technology issues. So a lot of good in insight there. So I would recommend that if you guys have any questions or want to see some more about uh, about those topics, definitely check out the Signals Research Group website. But uh, but for today, Mike, I know we're going to talk a bit about small cells. I know you guys just uh, did a new paper on the small cell topic. Uh, maybe you could give us, I guess, I guess, an overview of of the of the paper, kind of what, what went into the paper, what you guys found uh, through doing the doing the research. Sure. So this is kind of a what I would call small cells for dummies, or, or small cells for people that don't know about small cells. So part of it is, ex is explaining what a small cell is, because you know to some extent that's a new term. You know, you go back in the early days and it was femtocells, and then femtocells became microcells, small cells, picocells. You know, and so we kind of took a, an approach that says, okay, well, first of all, let's explain what a small cell is to people. Um, and so that was kind of one part of it. So very basic. You know, the next part is there's been a lot of hype and a lot of focus on small cells for, you know, half a dozen years now. And, and small cells really haven't taken off. You know, so why is that the case? If people really believe that small cells will be important in the future and a big market opportunity, we need to first of all understand why they really haven't been successful date, at least in terms of market adoption. Um, and then understanding why things have changed in the future, why we believe small cells, there will be a, a fairly robust market opportunity for them. And then kind of the, the last piece was really a modeling exercise to look at, you know, kind of the so-called capacity crunch or the data tsunami and taking a look at, you know, what happens if the data growth is as we expect it to be what does that really say in terms of the impact on the macro network and the need for other solutions to really offload um, the capacity from the macro cell site? And that's kind of the, the crux of the whole paper. Got it. Well, maybe I guess maybe touch a bit on, on that first part of it, which is, I mean, again, why haven't small cells uh, blown up like it was been predicted? Like, like you said, I mean, we've been talking about small cells for you know half a dozen years now. Uh, you know, femto cells do have a bit of a market. Uh, DAS has a bit of a market. Uh, but there's not been that adoption. I mean, we, you know, we keep hearing about the forecasts of hundreds of thousands of, of small cells being deployed eventually, and maybe we're still looking, you know, that'll happen at some point. But what to this point has been, uh, maybe what you guys found has been kind of, I guess, the challenge or the reasons why small cells have not quite uh, hit, that, hit that inflection point where, where everyone's expecting and everyone's predicting that, that growth to come from. Yeah, sure. So I think, first of all, if you look at, especially kind of North America with small cells, small cells were really a residential play you know, kind of solving the, the coverage problems that operators have. And in, in fact, I kind of have a uh, informal job in my neighborhood of advising my neighbors on small cells and various mm -hmm. solutions for, for improving the, the coverage in their homes. But, you know, when operators are selling into that market, they don't want to promote them because you're basically saying, I've got a poor network coverage <laughs> in a small cell. You know, so just inherently, it's not going to be a big market opportunity. Um, I think other reasons are when it comes to solving issues like capacity, operators still have somewhat of a grace period. You have LTE coming along. Uh, you take North America, you take an AT&T or a Verizon, they've got 3G capacity problems where all of a sudden you give them LTE, you give them new spectrum at 700, 1700. That goes a long way in the near terms in terms of providing you know, the, the capacity solutions that they need. And I think the last the last reason perhaps is that, you know, it's like any solution, the, the first the first implementations are somewhat immature, you know, and, and so some of the first solutions out there, you know, both from a hardware, from a chipset perspective, how it gets integrated into the network wasn't necessarily what you would need to have a large scale deployments. That that will change though in the future. Yeah, inter interesting topic. Yeah, you're right. I guess it does seem like you're right. I mean, with, with more spectrum being available, at least uh, to an extent, and I know more, more spectrum options coming up, you're right. That, that seems like a good way for carriers to avoid having to go to that small cell route at this point. I mean, they're definitely more comfortable. It seems like they're more familiar with macro cells and how those work and the traditional, you know, big towers. That seems to be uh, what everybody's comfortable with. And like you said, yeah, we're going with LTE, provides that uh, greater efficiency. 
uh, more spectrum obviously helps in, in most cases too. So uh, that does seem like it's been able, the carriers have been able to at least push off, at least in the near term, or, or, the, or kind of that, that need for small cells to this point too. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Now I guess now you know what you guys were looking at. What's what's the potential for small cells going forward? I mean, what what do you think is coming into play that will allow small cells to finally gain that traction um, that that people have expected, or do you think they'll gain traction? What's kind of your your, your view on, on you know when small cells will become more important? How will they become more important as part of the network? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I'll start off with this kind kind of some of the the qualitative reasons. Then we can turn to kind of some of the analysis that we did. Well, first of all, I, I think if you look at what's happening in the standards body, both with respect to 3G as well as with LTE, the standard now is much more conducive to small cells. So things like SON, you know, self-optimized, self, you know, self-deployed networks, you know, you really need that with small cells. I mean, you're talking, you know, a 10 to 1, a 5 to 1 ratio of small cells to macro cells. You need something that makes it very simplistic to deploy them, to maintain them, to optimize them, and that's coming, and that, that exists with LTE today. I think another reason is that uh, you know you have various architectures out there from different vendors that really make it conducive for supporting a large number of small cells in a controlled environment, and then tying that in to, to the network infrastructure and to, into the core network. Um, you look at the user experience. Um, you know operators. You know that always are focused on providing the better user experience. You know, tapping into small cells, not necessarily to solve capacity or coverage issues. We just imagine with small cells, basically you're, you're the only person on the cell, and if you have that in a in a in an outdoor environment, in a park, in a shopping mall, uh, in an airport, you know that's a phenomenal experience that you know operators can leverage to definitely sell consumers on the on the idea that their network is better. Um, I think another important reason is that operators are now very vocal and very committed to small cells. You know, and in the past they were kind of in that direction, but when you're talking about a residential play for improving coverage, they were a little bit careful. Mm -hmm. I, I think now that has definitely changed, and to some extent, operators are stepping on themselves or stepping over each other to say they're they're more they're more aggressive than the other guy. You know, and you have to look at them as being kind of the, the, the proof point, if you will. And I think finally, you know, we've gotten to the point now where operators have tapped into LTE. They're leveraging all the spectrum or a lot of the spectrum that they have. You know, they can't necessarily deploy any more macro cell sites. That's their only solution. So, it, 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 you know, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. They, they really have to deploy small cells to solve the looming capacity crunch. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you're right, too. I mean, I know some of the carriers have been a little more... Uh, aggressive in marketing their small cells. I know ATT's got a commercial running pretty uh, pretty regularly now, showing small cell deployments in buildings. And so, yeah, it, it seems like they've maybe gone, gotten past that that stigma of if you start promoting small cells, it is admitting that perhaps your coverage is not great in some areas. Uh, you know, ATT obviously has a bit of a history when it comes to uh, impacted coverage. You know, when they launched the iPhone several years ago, and a lot of big markets, their network, uh, you know, crashed a lot of markets. Uh, and so they were, you know, had, having to kind of get over that that stigma of having a bad network. And so uh, but it, it does seem like they're a little more comfortable now with admitting, yeah, hey, small cells can help. We're deploying them. Um, that, that seems to be a good, at least a good push for for the technology going forward. Yeah, and it's not necessarily saying we had a problem or we have a problem. We're solving it. Yeah. You know, the, the way the way AT and T is kind of positioning it is that we've got a great network. We're going to make it even better. You yeah. know, so they're kind of, they're kind of putting a, a positive spin on it. You know, but they they really need, and, and other operators really need to address you know, the issues of, of better capacity, improved coverage, as well as kind of improving the user experience. And I think to some extent you see that on the AT&T commercials when they talk about kind of the user experience and you have the two, the two engineers installing the small cells in, in office buildings or in the stadium. Yeah, yeah. That's good to see engineers, or at least people playing engineers in commercials nowadays instead of just, you know, attractive spokespeople. It's nice to see the engineers out there getting getting some props in the commercials. That's always a good thing, too. So. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you're maybe finally looking at it. I mean, what's... Uh, you know, looking forward to this. What are some of the challenges that maybe the industry still needs to tackle when it comes to to small cells? I mean, are there things that still could trip up, or things that they still need to kind of uh, get right first before small cells become can become a more integrated part of of, of network deployments? Yeah, so I, I think a couple of things. You know, backhaul is always a big challenge, as well as getting you know power to the site. So when you when you look at how small cells or or where small cells get deployed. 
you know, I think predominantly in the near term, it's going to be more indoors yep. than outdoors. You know, and, and and that's and that's understandable to some extent because most of your data traffic and voice traffic is still generated indoors. You know, and so you ha imagine somebody inside an airport that's actually, you know, and this happened with the early days of LTE, they weren't tapping into an indoor data solution. They're going to an outside macro site. Yeah. So it, it definitely impacts the performance. It's a, it's a bigger drain on the macro network because now you're penetrating several walls of a building to serve an indoor subscriber. You, so that indoor subscriber starts using a disproportionate amount of network resources. You know, but putting a small cell inside is definitely easier. Yeah. You know, you can tap into the buildings uh, in building wiring. You know, the Ethernet that definitely solves the backhaul capacity. If it's a really small cell, then you do power over Ethernet. Um, you know, so you basically solve your prop your your power problems there. Going outside is a little bit more problematic. You know, because now you need to have you know backhaul to that small site. You need to have power to that small site, and so that gets a little bit more more challenging. It's, you know, there's definitely there's dozens of companies out there literally that are, are trying to solve, you know, the backhaul challenges. Yeah. You know, using unlicensed technologies, uh, using in-band LTE, using microwave, using uh, millimeter wave, you, you name it. And I think all of those solutions will have an opportunity, but they have to mature as well before you'll really start to see small cells deployed outside, you know, in large volumes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the spectrum issue when it comes to small cells? I know there's been a lot of a lot of talk recently about using a 3.5 band for small cells. Uh, how important is it to kind of have, have perhaps it, it, its own spectrum band? I know. I mean, with like Wi-Fi, for instance, or life, unlicensed, you know, it has its own kind of band. Uh, it, will it be important for you think for small cells to have uh, perhaps their own little space in the uh, in the spectrum uh, pie? I guess uh, for, for the most part. I, I'd say I'd say yes and no. I mean, I mean, first of all, if you look at you know, it makes no sense for an operator to take really good cellular spectrum and dedicate it to small cells if they only have deployed a few small cells. That's really inefficient use of their spectrum. Um, you know, conversely, if you have a lot of small cells, um, then it makes sense to use dedicated spectrum just for the small cells. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, you know, there's certain frequency bands that are definitely ideal for small cells. Or at least they're maybe not as as good for for macro for macro cell size just because of the higher higher frequencies. There may be limited power restrictions. You know that's really ideal for small cells. You know 3.5 is definitely a band where that can be very attractive. You know talking about uh, the unlicensed LTE or LTEU. Yep. You know using kind of the, the Wi-Fi spectrum. Um, you know that's something that you're not going to radiate from a macro cell. Um, obviously, you know so it, it's really the perfect spectrum or almost the only spectrum that could be used when it comes to LTE would, would be using it in a small cell deployment. The, the forecast for you guys, what your plans are, what you guys see uh, uh, for small cells going forward? Yes, so part of what we did, you know, it's not necessarily a forecast per se, but we looked at the, you know, kind of the so-called capacity crunch and what happens if, if you believe that the various forecasts that exist for the growth of mobile data. So we kind of took that as, as the first step. Um, we looked at it really for the U.S. market um, and just for the for the two largest mobile operators, and then we also just focus on kind of more of the urbanized areas versus kind of doing it across the whole United States. So we kind of took the original like a Cisco forecast, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of massaging of it to get to kind of a forecast that was applicable, and then expanded it to 2020. Um, we made a lot of assumptions on, you know, kind of the uh, the ability to deploy more macro cell sites. Obviously, LTE as a technology will increase in spectral efficiency. Operators will get more spectrum. We we threw that all into into the pot, um, but still, it turns out, you know, starting in 2015, depending on the market, operators start to run out of spectrum. Um, now you take that out to uh, 2020. Um, if you assume that all of this, you know, the forecasted data growth was only coming from macro cells, um, even with the increase in spectral efficiency and more spectrum, operators or the two operators that we forecasted would need seven times the number of macro cell sites that they have today, just in the urban areas. Wow. You know, and when you consider that, you know, mobile operators, it's, it's very problematic to add cell sites, you know, in an area like, like San Francisco, like Denver, et cetera. So they're not going to get there that way. 
And so what it basically says is that if you believe that data growth and it can't be on macro cell sites, well then obviously small cells is an opportunity. Um, and what we found is that by 2020, you know, approximately 80% of all traffic that will be generated on, on a cellular technology will occur on something other than a macro cell site. Mm -hmm. um, if you believe that to be small cells, it suggests that you'd need you know, nearly 4 million small cells just to support, or we call it small cell capacity units, which is basically a, a 10 megahertz single sector small cell um, to support the capacity needs. Now using TDD is actually a little bit more attractive just because you have the ability to dedicate more capacity in the downlink versus the uplink and historically there is more data traffic in the downlink so that does reduce the number to about two and a half million small cell sites mm -hmm. or you know, small cells or small cell capacity units and that's just for capacity purposes that doesn't take into consideration small cells for coverage which I think will also be a very big opportunity so you know definitely I think this is why you know the market opportunity for small cells is very robust you know just because operators really have no other choice you know to support the growth in mobile data traffic unless they have you know small cells Wi-Fi DAS etc uh, to really solve you know the looming problem yeah that's interesting I mean you mentioned the fact that I mean some of these characters in the, in the models you show that's going to start even even next year basically 2015 it's you know again we're, we're months away from 2015 so uh, that, that capacity crunch could be hitting uh, perhaps uh, some operators sooner than uh, than would be comfortable I think for like maybe maybe for some of them so yeah, no, exactly. We act, we actually did a, a different study just as fairly recently, you know, looking at kind of performance of, of networks um, both in San Francisco and in Phoenix, and kind of looking at um, this is measuring real data traffic across an entire cell sector. Um, and what we found is that kind of the spectral efficiency of LTE isn't necessarily what people think it is. Um, you know, and and part of the problem is, you know, it's not that the technology is necessarily deficient. But it comes back to how the operators have deployed it. Mm -hmm. um, if you go in downtown San Francisco and and you have an outdoor macro site and all of your users are inside a building, you know now they're using you know very inefficient use of spectral resources. That has a big impact on spectral efficiency. You bring down your spectral efficiency of LTE, that further you know causes problems in terms of you know your future gr growth or your ability to support future growth if the capacity of LTE isn't what the operators thought it was. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Too. And like I said, I know uh, you guys have a lot of different research on your, on your website there at the uh, Signals Research Group. Uh, a lot of in-depth information on that. A lot of, I know you guys do a lot of network testing on your own. So uh, like I said, it's a lot of good insight into what's happening out there. And obviously, this new report on small cells is another good one, too. But, uh, but again, Mike, we definitely appreciate the time and insight today. Thanks so much for that. And I'm sure we'll talk to you guys again soon. Great. Thank you. All right.